Welcome everyone to Tour Today Ministries in our continuing series called Parsha Seasonings, where we take the weekly Torah portion and bring out some things that only reveal themselves in the Hebrew Scriptures or only in the Torah scroll. And this week's portion is called Ve'etchanan, and it is found in Deuteronomy 3, 23, up through chapter 7, verse 11. Now, before I continue, I encourage those of you who are listening to this teaching on uh, an audio podcast that you go to our website and print out the notes, or at least take a look at them there, because I'm using a lot of uh, images and photographs in this particular teaching. So you can go to www.torahtodayministries.org, and there you can take a look. So I don't want you to miss out on the graphics that will enrich this lesson. Okay, let's continue. Uh, Ve'etkanan means, and I implored, and it uses the word uh, chin in here, which is the word for grace. In other words, I implored Adonai to give grace. And Moses is asking God, God, give me another chance. I know I messed up, but please let me go into the land of Israel. Now, this Torah portion contains what is probably the most beloved passage, the most quoted passage in the Torah. And that, of course, is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, Adonai, our God, Adonai is one. In fact, when Yeshua in Mark's Gospel was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He quoted this passage. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God, and it continues on. Uh, and Deuteronomy 6.4, which contains the Shema, has uh, several very unique things going on with it. Now, not all printed versions of the Hebrew Scriptures show this. Some do, others do not. But in the Torah scrolls, the last letter of Shema, which is the ayin, is always written over size, and the last letter of Echad, one, is also written over size. Every Torah scroll in the world. So the question is, why? What's the purpose of this? Well, this first word, Shema, means hear, Shema. Um, we have a tribe called Shimon, which also comes from this word. And um, Shema means to hear, but it's also the word that means to obey. There is no separate Hebrew word in the scriptures for to obey God. And uh, this is kind of uh, inherent and understood instinctively with us, because if you have little children and they're not obeying, you don't look at them and say, obey me. You say, listen to me, listen to me. And uh, we understand somehow deep in our souls that to truly hear something, to truly hear it, requires a reaction, requires a response. And when we hear one in spiritual authority, especially from God himself, then we need to obey. Now, this letter ayin, its name means I, and it is even said to represent two eyes, but then here's the face, the chin, looking to the left. And this word ayin, I, comes at the end of Shema. This contains a very important lesson for us. I meet people who have come face to face with a commandment from God, instruction and guidance from God, but they don't obey because they say, I just don't get it. I just don't see it. Well, of course you don't. You must hear and obey before you can see. The seeing comes at the end of obedience, not at the beginning. And how many times have we had to walk by faith in what God here has said, because faith, after all, does come by hearing. And we have to walk by faith because we don't see how this is going to work, but we obey. And then, after we've obeyed, it's like, now I get it. Why couldn't I have seen that before? Well, you can't see it until you obey. Ayan, eyes, come at the end of Shema, not at the beginning. Now, over here, we have the word ichad, which means one. 
And the last letter of Echad, the Dalit here, is written oversized. Now, there are two letters in Hebrew which look very similar. One is the Dalit, which is the letter here at the end of Echad. But another letter is the letter Resh. You can see how they're very, very similar. The only difference is Dalit has a very sharp corner. Resh has a rounded corner. So the rabbis say one of the reasons God inspired the scribes to make the Dalit large is so that it would not be confused with a Resh. Because if you spell Echad with a Resh, it comes out as Achar, which means another, which would make the Shema read this way. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is another God, meaning there is more than one. We can't get that wrong. Can't get that confused. But more even than that, when you take Ayan and Dalit together, they spell the word Aid, which is the Hebrew word for testimony. And the Shema has been Israel's testimony since Israel started. Because to say that Adonai is our God and that he is one is not just saying there's only one God. There were, after all, some pagan religions at the time that also believed in only one God. What they're saying is here is that he is not only the only one, but he is everywhere. He is involved in everything. And everything in the world is touched by him and is somehow upheld by him, and he is infused into everything in existence. And um, it's a much bigger statement than just saying there's only one God. But they're saying he's the God who is and with whom we have to do, and none of us escape his attention. So uh, I could go on and on and on about the Shema, but we have more things to cover here. Uh, this is the way the Shema appears in a Torah scroll. There you can see the Shema with the enlarged ayin, and there's the word Echad with the enlarged Dalit. But the rabbis have also noticed if you take the four letters of Shema and Echad, the ones that are not enlarged, that would be the Shin and the Mem of Shema, and the Aleph and Ket of Echad, and you put them together, they spell the word esmach, I will rejoice. You know, there's nothing coincidental about God's word. And if Yeshua could say that not one jot or tittle will pass from the Torah until all is fulfilled, that means not just the little decorations and smallest letters, but even things like this are placed there by hand by our Creator, who created His word to reflect Himself. And the details are incredible. And I know I quote this often in these teachings, but in Psalm 119, David says, Adonai, unveil my eyes that I may behold wonders from your Torah. And I think these are some of the wonders that the Torah contains for us. Now, the Shema continues. You have this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it goes on, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these commandments I teach you today shall be upon your heart. And it goes on for several verses. And in the eighth verse, it says, You will bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. That word for frontlets in Hebrew is the word totafot, and it's only found here in Scripture. And so how to translate that has always been an issue. In uh, Judaism, they refer to these totafot or frontlets as tefillin, tefillin. And here you can see a photograph of an Israeli soldier who is praying. He has his siddur in his hand, and he's donned his tefillin. Now, the tefillin are leather boxes. You can see one here that is on his arm, and the strap is wrapped around his forearm and around his hand. And then there's another tefillin called the head tefillin, the tefillin shell roche, and it goes up here. Now, there are four places in the Torah where wearing tefillin, or these, these, uh, these boxes, are commanded, or is commanded. And uh, those four places are Exodus 13, 1 to 10, Exodus 13, 11 to 16, 
Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, which we usually refer to as the Shema passage, and Deuteronomy 11, verses 13 to 21. So, since these are the four places, the four passages that command this mounting of God's Word on our hand and between our eyes, that's the passage, those are the four passages of Scripture that are written on parchment and placed within these boxes. And I happen to have here a pair of tefillin, and this is the hand tefillin. You can see it's a leather black box, and inside of the hand tefillin, which is mounted up here on the forearm, uh, on the bicep rather, um, there is one piece of parchment, and it's handwritten in Hebrew with all four of these passages. So the piece of parchment is about so long, about so tall, and after they have to write very small, they roll it all up and it goes in here. Now, the tefillin that goes on the head is a little different. This is the tefillin shel rosh. And in this box, there are four compartments, and each of the passages are written on their own separate piece of parchment. So each piece of parchment is rolled up and placed into a slot and actually goes up through the bottom into separate compartments. And so these four are separate. Now, why on the hand is it all on one sheet and on the head it's on four separate sheets of parchment? Well, I can only surmise that the reason is, is because in our minds is where we differentiate. We have understanding, bina, which comes from the word bain, between. And we differentiate the verses. We look at the shadings and the colorings and the meanings and the spellings. But in our actions, we simply do God's word. So here it's all on one piece of parchment. It's all together. But in our minds, we must differentiate. And we must think distinctly about things. But there's another difference, an even bigger difference, a visible difference, and that is this. On the sides of the head to fill in, you'll find the letter sheen. There's the letter sheen. And the letter sheen has an S or an SH sound, and it has three stalks coming up. And on the head to fill in, here you can see a photograph of the one I'm holding. And this is on the right side of the tefillin, and there you can see the sheen with its three stalks. But something very strange happens on the left side of the tefillin. So if we turn this around, you'll notice there's also a letter sheen, but this one has four stalks to it. And this is the only place anywhere in the Jewish world, or in Hebrew, that I'm aware of, where you find a sheen written with four stalks. So the question is, why? Why have a sheen on here at all? In addition, why do you have two sheens? And on top of that, why does one of the sheens have four stalks instead of just three? No one knows the, the definite answer for this, but one, one tr uh, tradition, one theory is that sheen, sheen spells the word sas, which means rejoice, to, be, to have joy. And when we put God's word into our minds and we're thinking about it, we should be filled with sas, filled with joy. Another theory is that since the Shema begins with the letter sheen, sheen, which means to hear and to obey, should be mounted on the head to fill in. But why is there a sheen on both sides? Well, you know, in Scripture, this is something we'll talk about in another teaching. Whenever you see right and left mentioned in Scripture, without exception, right always refers to the spiritual, the left always refers to the physical. It doesn't mean the good and the bad. It just simply means the two realms in which we as human beings dwell. We dwell in the spiritual realm, we dwell in the physical realm. And that tells me that we need to hear spiritually and physically and we need to obey in our hearts and in our actions, spiritually and physically again. But that still doesn't answer the question of why this sheen has four 
stalks on the left side. Well, the rabbis say if you add the three stalks on the right with the four stalks on the left, and there's probably a better word than stalk here, but if you come up with one, use it instead. But if you add them together, you have seven, which is a number of completion, a number of perfection. And if you recall, the menorah in the tabernacle and later in the temple had seven stalks, seven branches. And something that's interesting is that when you, in the morning, when you don tefillin, there's a blessing you say before you put this one on your arm and wrap it around your forearm. And then there's a series of blessings that are spoken when you put the head tefillin on. And then there are other blessings you say when you finish wrapping the hand to fill in around your fingers and your hand. I want to draw your attention to one of these blessings. And this is when the head to fill in is placed in place. It says, may your goodly oil, uh, I'm sorry, may you pour your goodly oil upon the seven arms of the menorah, that your good may flow to every living creature. And then it goes on and and uh, open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Pour your goodly oil upon the seven arms of the menorah. It's almost as if we're saying, as we take your word into our minds, into our hearts and our deeds, we become a light to the world. We become a living menorah. And it's only appropriate that as a menorah, we have seven branches and the tefillin has four on one and three branches on the other side, seven branches. And make us a light, pour your good Lord oil upon us. And you know, the anointing would take place on the head. It's almost as if God is saying, when you're anointed, I'm filling you with oil so you can burn brightly in this world. But this isn't a physical flame, it's a spiritual flame. And Shin is always referred to as the letter of fire. It looks like a flame with its, its branches sticking up, and it makes a sursh sound like fire does. Well, you know, as I was pondering these things some years back, I was reminded of the day of Pentecost. In Hebrew, it's called Shavuot. And the first Pentecost was not in Acts chapter 2. Uh, Pentecost started several thousand years before that. And Pentecost, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, is the celebration of God giving the Torah on Mount Sinai. And if you read the account of how God gave the Torah on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus, you know that fire came to rest upon the mountain. There was, a, there was a, the loud sound of the shofar. I mean, it was a big deal. And so when you fast forward to Acts chapter 2, you find the apostles in the house we must understand when we read that, the house that is being referred to as the house of the Father, they were in the temple. That's where everyone goes on Shavuot. My uh, second son and I had the privilege of being in Jerusalem on Shavuot a few years ago. And oh my goodness, it's a 24-hour celebration of people dancing and praying and singing, then going to their synagogues and studying, then coming back and praying and dancing some more. 24 hours all night long and they come from all over the world and in Acts chapter 2 the same thing was happening so the apostles would have been at the temple that's where they would have been that's where you go on Shavuot it's one of the three pilgrimage feasts where the males of Israel are to come to Jerusalem to rejoice before the Lord now Tefillin are worn six days a week, but they're not worn on Shabbat. It's just tradition. You don't wear them on Shabbat. It's a day of uh, extra infused holiness, so the tefillin are left off on Shabbat. And also, tefillin not, are not worn on some of the other holy days, like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and, uh, and also Shavuot. So the apostles would have been at the temple, but they would not have been wearing their tefillin. But it's almost as if God gave them spiritual to fill in, because we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, And there came suddenly a sound out of heaven as of a violent, impetuous blowing. Now remember, at, Pentecost, or at Sinai, at Pentecost, there was a sound of the blowing of a shofar from heaven. 
and filled all the house, which is, of course is referring to the temple in the courtyard where they were sitting. And there appeared to them parted tongues of fire, parted tongues of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. Well, if Shin is a letter of fire, we see it's parted. And there's one on one side and one on the other. It's almost as if God was putting a pair of spiritual, holy, living tefillin on the foreheads of his apostles. And then they spoke to the people around them and began to announce the good news of who Yeshua is and of his kingdom. Pretty amazing stuff, if you ask me. So, where do we go from here? You know, whether you wear tefillin or not is something that's between you and God. I find having tangible things as I pray and as I go before the Lord and worship helps unite my body and my spirit together and in unity in ichad, so I can praise Him and worship Him and study together, uh, spirit, soul, and body united. But whether you do that or not, that's up to you. But one thing is for certain. Whether you wear physical tefillin or not, we must have God's word bound up here next to our heart. We must have it in our minds and it must be seen in our deeds. Because if it isn't, then it's not really God's word that's impacting you. You're meant to be a pipe and not a bucket. You're not just here to absorb scripture and theology you are to have it come into you so it can flow out of you, so you can be a living menorah. And that the oil of God's Spirit might shine brightly in you, but it must be in our minds. It has to be in our thoughts before it can be in our hearts and our actions. So anyways, I hope this little seasoning of the Parsha is a blessing to you, and I hope that you'll never look at the Shema quite the same again. So, until next time, I bid you shalom and may God bless. The end.